Hello everybody and welcome back to The Power of Reason. This is the third episode of this series. So once again, it all makes better sense if you start from episode one, if you haven't done so already. Today we will see how our emotions, also known as our affects, have an influence on our judgments. We have seen last time how the availability heuristic is a shortcut that our brain uses to judge something based on how easily it comes to mind. The affect heuristic is slightly different. It is a shortcut that we subconsciously use to judge something based on our current emotions or based on the emotions evoked by that particular subject. And this happens without any further analysis. When we are asked what we think about something, we tend to actually report what we subconsciously feel about it. And then we think that that is our rational answer. For example, people who smile like that are judged more favorably, independently of what we are told of them. If I describe someone to you and I show you a smiling picture of them, you will like them more than if the picture was without a smile. It has been done experimentally actually, and this is because we subconsciously feel better about a smile. Or again, if you like the president, you're more likely to agree with one of his new policies and vice versa, if you, if you dislike him, you are likely to disagree with him. And by doing so, well, that saves you having to investigate in depth and engaging in tiring rational thinking, which would of course be required to properly assess the policy in question. It is very difficult in everyday life to recognize how our decisions and our judgments are affected by our, by our feelings about something. For this reason, the effect heuristic is best understood with a few experiments. And trust me, tonight I have plenty of experiments that I'm gonna present to you. Excuse me. Let's start with what I call the ice cream experiment. So in this experiment, the participants from one group of people were asked how much they were willing to pay for a seven ounce of ice cream served in an overfilled six ounce cup. So this, the cup was smaller uh, and overfilled with ice cream. In the second group, participants were asked how much they were willing to pay for eight ounce of ice cream, so more than before, before it was seven ounce that they were getting. But this time they were served in an underfilled 10 ounce cup, so a bigger cup, but underfilled. All the participants knew how much ice cream they were be being given or they were buying, but people in the first group were willing to pay more. And they made that decision based entirely on the good feeling of an overfilled cup rather than on the number that was representing how much ice cream they were actually getting. So they affect their emotional response, guided their decision more than the information that they were actually receiving. Let's see another old experiment, which I call the drowning birds experiment. So after an infamous oil spill that happened several years ago, three separate groups of people were asked how much they were willing to pay for nets that would cover the oil ponds generated by this oil spill in the ocean. And the reason to cover the oil spill with nets is to save birds from drowning because Normally, they would just sit on the on the pool and just get stuck there. People in the first group were told that the nets would save 2,000 birds. In the second group, 
people were told that the nets would save 20,000 birds. In the third group, 200,000 birds were saved. So, each one had to offer how much they were willing to pay. The surprising result is that in each group, people averaged the exact same offering, about $80. This is because numbers alone do not have any effect on our decision, if there's no frame of reference. What does have an effect is our emotions, so the sad image of a drowning bird. So, to come up with $80, the participants subconsciously matched the emotional intensity of how sad they felt to a sum of money that they were willing to pay. People were actually in completely, completely insensitive to the numbers in making their decision, whether it was 2,000, 20,000, 200,000, it didn't matter at all. Another experiment, the airline travel insurance experiment. So in this experiment, a group of people were asked how much they were willing to pay, I, I think you guessed the format for now, how much they were willing to pay for airline travel insurance covering death from terrorist acts. Another separate group were asked how much they were willing to pay for air travel insurance covering any death. The surprising result is that the first group was willing to pay more, even if the second option, the second insurance, covered a lot more. And this is because the scenario of the terrorist act is more specific and evocative, and so the emotional response is stronger. So people subconsciously matched the sum of money to the intensity of their emotion. This is another example of the effect heuristic at work. Of course, these are two separate groups that didn't know what's going on in the other group. Um, the effect heuristic applies also to experts, not only to people buying ice cream or travel insurance. So in another experiment, there were two separate groups again, but this time, the people in the experiment were forensic psychologists and psychiatrists, so expert clinicians. And they were asked if a hypothetical mental patient was ready to be discharged from the hospital. Some of them in one group were told that 20 out of 100 patients, similar to the hypothetical Mr. Jones, were estimated to commit a violent act again. This is the mental patient that was supposed to be discharged. 20 out of 100 patients estimated to commit a violent act, act again. Another group of them were told that 20% of patients, similar to Mr. Jones, were estimated to commit a violent act again. So they all received the same data because 20 out of 100 is the same as 20%. But the information was framed differently. Clinicians who received the information framed as 20 out of 100 were half as likely to discharge the patient, to discharge Mr. Jones, than clinicians who received the information as a percentage of 20%. Um, they were twice as likely. Um, and this is because a percentage doesn't really elicit the same emotional response as the image of 20 people committing a violent act. So people who received information as 20 out of 100, they could picture the 20 people and they thought, oh, it's quite dangerous to discharge Mr. Jones. So they weren't as likely to discharge him. So once again, the subconscious emotional response is what affected the decision. Even of the experts, oops, even of the experts. And this is one of the reasons why in medicine, there are some standard procedures to be followed and not just, you know, your gut feeling. 
I hope you're not tired of experiments yet because we need a couple more to get a full picture. So another experiment. People were asked how in favor they were of a new airport safety measure. One group was told that the measure would save 98% of 300 lives at risk. The second group was simply told that it would save 300 lives. People in the first group were more favorable towards the measure because even if technically fewer lives were being saved, 98% seems like a very successful proportion. But if you say just 300% on its own, it doesn't give a comparable sense of the benefit. So people were less in favor because they thought, ah, well, how good, it, how good could it possibly be saving 300 people? Sounds harsh, but that's how our subconscious works. But this brings me to the point that I want to make, which is that having a sense of comparison helps with judgment. And without a sense of comparison, we can only rely on the affect heuristic, on our emotional response. So in this final experiment, two separate groups of people with no music, musical expertise, so just random people, were asked to rate a musical dictionary. One group was given a 10,000 word musical dictionary and another group were given a 20,000 word dictionary. Both the dictionaries were new, but the 20,000 word one had a small tear on the front page. People had no term of comparison, so we have seen that numbers alone don't elicit an emotional response, so 10,000, 20,000 didn't matter. So naturally, in the second group, people rated the dictionary lower because of the tear in the front cover, even if he had more words. After all of this experiment, a third group of people was given both dictionaries and they were asked to rate them. And as you can imagine, in this group, like we would expect, people rated the 20,000 word dictionary higher because the benefit was apparent. So now we understand a bit better how the effect heuristic works. We're not stupid or irrational, but you know, when we don't have a term of comparison, that's what we rely on. The question now is, of course, as always, why do we need to know all of this? The most important consequence of the effect heuristic in our understanding and in our understanding of the world is that it influences how we judge anything, an activity or a technology based on how we feel about it, especially when the judgment is made in a hurry without actually investigating or evaluating in depth. In particular, if we like an activity or a technology, or if it is associated with a positive feeling, then we tend to overestimate its benefits and underestimate its risks. For example, if you like smoking, you will understand, we, you will underestimate its risks. This is why in many countries, cigarette advertising is not permitted because it would create a positive emotional response associated with the smoking. Mm, people who are not in favor of nuclear energy, this is another example, People are not in favor of nuclear energy, they associate the term nuclear with war, with the bomb, and Chernobyl, which is the only nuclear energy accident that had casualties. The emotional response is, of course, a negative one. These people are more likely to believe that nuclear energy has higher risks and lower benefits. This is in spite of the fact that nuclear energy does not emit CO2, which is a great benefit, and it statistically is the safest form of energy of all, if you count the number of deaths per unit energy produced. 
You can contrast this in paradox in almost paradoxically to the most dangerous form of energy, which is coal. Uh, and it is also the most widely employed form of energy in the world. And it kills the most people per unit energy produced because of the fumes spewed in the atmosphere, and which amounts to tons upon tons of uncontained waste, by the way. But it does not have the same negative emotional response in the public imagination, coal. And it is an interesting case because it shows how public opinion is shaped by the effect bias, as well as by the availability bias, of course. What is interesting to notice is that when we think of something as risky, we tend to ignore its benefits and vice versa. When we think of something as good, we tend to ignore its risks. And in fact, when we see a benefit, the risks automatically seem lower, even if no information is added about it. So in a famous experiment, <laughs> here we go with another experiment, some people were asked what they thought about a particular technology. And they had to give a rating for the benefits and a rating for the risks of that specific technology. After their initial assessment, the participants were explained in detail a series of benefits of that specific technology that they had just rated. And then, after this lecture on the benefits of that technology, they were asked to report the, to repeat, sorry, the assessment of the benefits and the risks. And naturally, the, now that they were more informed about it, they rated the benefits higher. But the most interesting part of this is that they also rated the risks lower even if no information was provided about the risks at all. The information was only about the benefits. So they felt the benefits were higher, suddenly they thought of the risks as lower automatically. This means that there is a negative correlation between perceived risk and perceived benefit. When in real life, the correlation is usually positive. In real life, more benefit usually comes with more risks. But apparently, that's not what happens in our minds. Our like or dislike of something is usually exacerbated by another bias, which is known as the confirmation bias. When we search for evidence, we tend to accept what confirms our presumed knowledge, and we tend to dismiss any information which challenges it. You know, when you go on Google and Wikipedia and so on, that's what we do. In this way, our likes and our dislikes of, in the, you know, of anything determine our beliefs about the world, right? Our political preference determines the arguments that we find compelling. If we like a public policy, we believe its benefits are larger than they actually are and we, neglect, we tend to neglect its risks. And we only search for evidence which confirms our beliefs. This is how we, most of us act, and we have to be aware of that. It's important to be aware of this and these cognitive patterns in order to be more self-critical and more objective in our analysis, and also in order to be less politically polarized. <clears throat> Now, on that note, I think uh, it is time to part ways for now. And in the next episode, I will go more in depth on our intuitive mind. And I will explore something that not many people talk about, which is how we are so overconfident in our own knowledge. And if you're shocked by this notion, well, point proven, really. So. See you soon and thank you.